it's uh, 5 30 in Paris, so we're going to start uh, this uh, seminar this time. Uh, I am very happy to introduce my colleague, Catherine Erickson, who works with me at UC Davis, but I only see on Zoom these days, <laughs> as everybody else. She's going to talk about understanding the success of the Know Nothing Party, 45 minutes. Given that the paper is on populism and vote, I remind my American colleagues to vote between now and November 3rd. This is a very important election. Uh, Catherine, take it away. Hey, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks to all the organizers for um, inviting me and for uh, everyone who showed up. So we're gonna talk about the Know Nothing Party. This is a party that was the first nativist party in the United States in history. We sweeped to power in 1854, um, taking a lot of governorships um, across the Northeast in the United States. And they really come on the back of Irish immigration from the potato famine. We're going to look at economic factors that explain the rise of this party um, and thinking about why they were successful in this period at this time in a, a certain context. Okay, so if we think about, um, we're going to be looking at Massachusetts, and we'll tell you a little bit in a minute why, but this is just sort of national immigration to the United States from Ireland over the period we're going to be looking at. And so you can see, again, this big potato famine um, in the 1840s um, really ends up sent, sending a million Irish, over a million um, people from Ireland to come to the United States. And a lot of those are going to settle in Massachusetts. Most of them settle in the Northeast. Um, 1854, this red line is when the know nothings come to power. And so again, they're, they're able to really take advantage of this large immigration shock to really sort of pivot towards this anti-immigrant nativist sentiment. This is an American Patriot newspaper. It's a paper in Boston um, that was affiliated with the, the um, Know Nothing Party. So this tells you a little bit about what the party's platform is. Um, so if you think about sort of, you don't have to read, but like down here, basically, this is what they're standing for. They say that they're threatening our jobs. Um, that we want to protect the mid-skilled mechanics from the poor foreign labor. They want to restrict voting rights. Um, they want to send back the foreign paupers and criminals. And they think they're being taxed and they're, and they're unfairly having to support this, this group of people that are not like them. They're Catholic, we're Protestant. And so therefore, they think they're also, their allegiance is to the Pope and not to the United States. And so there's a lot of this just sort of discussion about this coming out. And this party is able to really take advantage of this um, sentiment and come into power. So we're going to be looking again at Massachusetts. Henry Gardner was the governor of Massachusetts who was elected in 1854 and inaugurated in January 1855. Um, as this is his inaugural speech, he says some sort of stuff that might seem familiar today, but basically he says that the immigrants don't understand the United States, they don't understand our institutions, they're not assimilating, that they are essentially a burden on the state, they're sending their criminals, their paupers, and we have to support them with our tax money. And then this other one is very more, much more an economic argument that essentially that the, the immigrants are threatening native jobs, um, that there is sort of this um, crowding out or pushing Americans out of certain types of jobs. And so that's what we're going to think about. We have two labor market or economic factors. Um, one is this one that is identified by Gardner in his speech and also has really been discussed by historians. Uh, we're going to call this labor market crowd out. Um, it's not going to be wages, but it's going to be sort of thinking about different types of um, occupation groups and how likely Irish are to move into those types of groups. And so Fogel, sort of our classic economic historian, said that, you know, this nativist political movement would not have succeeded had it not had this massive immigration shock um, right before it. Um, and then the second thing we're going to talk about is just there's other economic change going on at the same time, right? So just like sort of today, when we think about factors behind what's happening, this is a time of massive industrialization, especially in Massachusetts. And this is also sort of urbanizing and, and this is sort of just dislocating a lot of um, things that were happening. And so this is also changing how the sort of mid-skilled workers, how their labor market prospects look, right? So we're industrializing, we're moving jobs from small shops into factories. When we do that, it's called, a, they call it de-skilling because we're basically lowering the skill to content of jobs, right? A, a middle-skilled person, sort of an artisan was doing this. And now as it moves the job into a factory, it's a low-skilled laborer that takes over. So this is going to have economic effects and therefore we show that it also has effects on voting behavior. All right, so the first question is always, why Massachusetts? Why aren't you doing this at the national level? And the first real explanation for that is sort of this historical literature that says politics are local in this period. The Know Nothing Party does not have a national platform. In fact, every state, they have a different platform. So we're looking at Massachusetts where they're the most nativist in terms of what they're, the policies they are trying to do. The second thing is they just win everything there. Um, it's really their, their most striking victory, as some historians have said. Um, they win all but three seats in the legislature, and they win the governorship with, I think, 63% of the vote in 1854, and they keep the governorship for three more years. So they're going to win in 1854, 55, and 56, um, and get kicked out in 57. 
very good for us that they vote every year <laughs> in this period. And then the final sort of like just, um, they have really good data. So Massachusetts is the first the first state to really keep really great data. Uh, this allows us to do some stuff when we construct our exposure measures to these two different economic shocks. All right, so let me tell you what we find. I'll show you how. Um, so we have a town level regression. The town is sort of the economic unit of analysis in Massachusetts. Everything is reported at that level. Um, we have about 308 towns. So we're gonna have these two measures of crowd out and descaling. We're gonna see that both of those predict the rise of the party in 1854. If we sort of say, how big are these effects? We get these sort of counterfactual reductions and we take them away of about 15% of the know-nothing vote. So we're not really explaining the fixed effect of why did everyone in Massachusetts vote for this party, but we really do explain a lot of the variation across towns and why some towns voted more for the party than others. This next one is wrong. They were just decisive in 1855. And so it really actually flipped the vote um, in that year. Um, we don't see that these sort of cultural factors that, to the best we can measure them, that they really explain a whole lot, the sort of idea of fiscal burden or you know, assimilation. We see that as we get closer to the Civil War, the party really loses for a few reasons, but mostly the Republican Party takes over the anti-slavery platform, which was also part of the Know Nothings platform. And so the economic factors start to be less and less important as we get closer to this really big fight over slavery. I'm going to see that uh, sort of heterogeneity, that this effect of labor market crowd out is bigger in towns that have more Irish in them. So the mechanism is not through turnout, through actually people shifting their allegiance. And then the big question people have is sort of, is there an economic effect, right? So like we're, we're showing sort of this reduced form that we have these economic threats and then we have your voting behavior. And so that in, sort of in between phase, I um, was thinking about, are these native workers really being hurt? And so I'm not gonna have time to show this today because it's 45 minutes, but we do see that the wealth of native workers if you experience more crowd out in your occupation, your wealth is gonna decrease more between 1850 and 1860, right? And so there is sort of this economic effect. We also see these people uh, adjust by moving and like upgrading their occupation, um, but sort of at the end of the day, there is sort of this like decrease in wealth for workers that were really affected. And we don't see the Irish affected industrialization. You might be worried that industrialization and the crowd out actually sort of interact. We don't see that that actually happens in this very short run period. All right, so I'll tell you where we're going. The only reason I have this is so to be patient through the historical background. History, history papers have a lot more of that, and then we'll get to data and results. Um, so just like I said, this is a very large shock to the Native worker in terms of Irish immigration. Boston itself got over 100,000 Irish in this decade. It's called the Dublin of America. And, you know, just sort of across the state, we see a very large increase in the percent Irish in each town. Um, they don't just go to Boston, they go to the mill towns and work in textiles, they, they go sort of all over the place. And what's going to be really helpful for us later when we get to some issues with identification is that the Irish are lower skilled than other European immigrants that are also coming at this time. The two big groups that would be found in Massachusetts, although to a lesser extent, are the German 1848ers. They tended to go sort of further away from the eastern seaboard, but we do see some of them pop up in Massachusetts. Um, and then there's some British immigrants who are very high skilled, right? So both of these groups are a little bit more high skilled and a little bit more um, similar to the native population. So we're going to use them as sort of placebo groups and show that no one really cares if they come to your town. It's really the, the Irish that are coming in. And so there's sort of a nativism, anti-Catholic thing going on. So we said Gardner talked about sort of this one economic force, which was, are they competing for our jobs? The other side is this sort of de-skilling and structural transformation, right? So again, if you're a voter and you say my job is going away or I'm getting lower wages, why is that? You can blame that on labor market crowd out or competition, but it's also happening because there's just huge structural transformation going on in Massachusetts in this period. Agriculture really goes away by 1850. It's not a big part of Massachusetts economy by then, um, because why would you grow things there when you could grow them in the Midwest uh, once we connect our networks? And we see that manufacturing just booms by 1855, right? It's sort of this unparalleled in the world. They call Lowell, Massachusetts, the Manchester of New England. And the boot and shoe production in particular, Massachusetts takes up a third of the country's output. So industry becomes very important. And as this happens so quickly, you're really changing um, the sort of skill content of jobs. So like we think about today, like skill bias, technological change, right? Technological change is good. In this period, it's actually the opposite. Mechanization or the movement into factories is actually complementary with low-skilled labor, not high-skilled labor. And so this leads to this sort of hollowing out of this middle class, right? The middle artisans, mid-skilled artisans um, are losing their jobs to low-skilled workers in the factories. And so there's sort of these different ways this happens, but really this was sort of going to really decrease the, the well-being of the sort of middle-class Americans. Um, we can put that into a baby conceptual framework, just the supply and demand framework with skilled and unskilled workers. 
And you can think about our two economic shocks then and sort of what they're doing in terms of the well-being. Again, we can't really test this because there is no wage data in this period, but we can you sort of think through how this is going to affect different groups. So you think about the industrialization part, the fall in demand for the high-skilled workers and an increase in demand for low-skilled workers as we sort of move towards using them for our prior types of jobs. This tends to depress high-skilled and actually raise low-skilled worker wages. But then the Irish shock is a very... Um, a skill bias shock, right? It's very much more low skilled than high skilled. Um, so this is going to sort of bring down wages in the um, in the unskilled market and then further suppress them in the skilled market to the extent that anything's going on. Right. So I think this really means that this affects both skilled and unskilled, possibly skilled more because there's sort of two shocks that interact with each other. But really these both of these these types of jobs are going to be hurt a little bit by by these two economic factors happening. So we're going to sort of, we can't test this, right? So again, I think that the semi-skilled, the mid-skilled people definitely have lower wages. The low-skilled should fall. There's not great data in this period. We've tried a few things. There's just not enough detail. Um, so again, we're sort of focusing on the reduced form um, of like threats and economic shocks and um, nativist voting behavior as a response. All right, just a little bit more about the party sort of why they came to power in 1854, right? It's like, so this industrialization has been happening for decades. The Immigration shock is about a 10 year shock. Um, so why is it in 1854 that they actually win power? But it's really because the, the Whig party collapses, right? So in 1850, we have a compromise over um, slavery and sort of new states coming into the union. The Whig party falls apart over slavery and makes a sort of vacuum essentially. So the second party system ends and the Know Nothing Party is sort of competing with the Republicans for a few years to become that second party nationally. And they're basically the coalition party. So this party is, it's kind of, <laughs> it's an interesting uh, mix of things, right? They're a populist party. They're sort of progressive and that they like spending money and in infrastructure. They're also anti-slavery because they just don't want slavery to expand. But really they're defining features nativism. And that's sort of how they, if you read the speeches and you read the literature, that's really what they sort of try to drum up votes based on. Um, and again, they're sort of the anti-party. A lot of these people who become politicians are not career politicians. Um, they're sort of these people who are not the not the elite Whigs, but they're new politicians coming in. Um, they're also very bad at running a government. But this always comes up. I mean, just mentioned enfranchisement, who can vote. So our voting data, again, is just going to be a town level who, like, how many, what percent of the people vote for the Know Nothing Party. And so what's important there is to know that the Irish are able to vote if they've been here in the United States for five years, right? So it's, if you're naturalized, um, you're able to vote. You don't have to, um, there's no like property requirements. They don't require proof of citizenship. And then none of the things in fact said that, you know, people are not naturalizing before they vote. I think that's probably not true. I think that they were naturalizing very quickly so that they could vote. The Democrats really wanted to get the Irish vote out. Voting in this period is not great. Your employer can tell you how to vote with open ballot and sunset laws meant that low skilled people probably couldn't get to the polls because they closed at sunset. Um, but in general, it's a pretty open system relative to some other states or some other places at the time. And then also one of the big platforms that the Know Nothing Party had was to try and disenfranchise these new Irish voters, right? And so they wanted to have a 21 year requirement before you could naturalize and vote. That did not pass. Uh, but they did manage to pass a literacy test in 1857, which only applied to new voters which happens to be new Irish voters. And so this is basically a way to disenfranchise that population. Um, and they were the second state to be successful at that. We are not gonna show that today, but we've looked a little bit at those votes too, and they seem to work in the same way as our regular votes. Okay, let's move on to all the data we've collected and why this paper took five years to write. So our main outcome is going to be again, no nothing vote share. Um, we're gonna digitize this from 1852 before, well, it's the Whigs in 1852. We've got all parties from 1852 all the way through 1859. And they win in 1854. And so that's our first year of really primary analysis. Um, and you can see that sort of, there's a lot of variation across the state. You can't read this, but there's a lot of variation across the state and support for this party sort of all over. Um, but then by 19, 19, 1857, the support really goes away. There's some left on the seaboard. We're going to see that fishermen actually are very upset that the Irish are moving in. But in general, the whole, part, the whole sort of support collapses by 57 and the party loses that year for the first time. Um, and then we have 55 and 56 in the middle as well. Calculate from that turnout. Um, so we have the number of, vote, number of voters in every year. So the question is, as a fraction of people who are eligible to vote in 1854, the question there is sort of basically saying, you know, is it just drawing in new voters? Is it are these shocks sort of pushing people from voting? And we don't see anything on that. And then on the constitutional amendment, this one for literacy, 
when they actually amend the state constitution, we don't have the local town votes, but we do have the fraction of your town representatives who voted yes for this amendment when it passed in 57. And I don't think I have time to show that today, but basically we see that labor market crowd up also predicts that in the sense that this nativist thing is in response to economic um, competition from immigrants. Okay, so we're going to create two, we're going to call exposure indexes, where essentially you could think about sort of any otter paper that you have in your mind, where essentially we're going to take local shares times state level shifts, and we're going to add those up across occupation groups or industries. So here, again, we're in a cross-sectional world because we only have essentially one year of X variables. And so our identification really is going to be the conditional and everything else, all the covariates we can throw in, um, we are getting the, the effect of the causal effect of these things. What we're going to do is sort of lag our shares as far back as we can go so we can get at least away from this idea that, immig that immigration is really causing the shares or anything like that. But the, really, the real question is sort of does, do these local shares, are they correlated with the things we're looking at because the Irish sort of attracted, were attracted to these places or that the Irish actually coming in allowed you to move things into factories? And that's sort of the big question that we had. We don't see that. So this is just our, before I get to the rest of the data, I'll just show you sort of our first conclusion about industrialization. And so if you look here, obviously there's some, if you look at just levels of this establishments per capita, manufacturing value per capita from the manufacturing census. And then we're just regressing that percent Irish. So this is not a causal statement. It's just descriptive. But once we live in changes, we look at the change in establishments over this 10 year period when the Irish are moving in, we look at the change in value per capita when the Irish are coming. We don't see that really, at least significantly, that there's any sort of correlation with the Irish moving in. So it doesn't seem that there's a lot of um, Irish causing this industrialization. Okay, so this is where as economic historians, we like to show our fancy data. So this paper took five years to write because we had to go and digitize 300,000 handwritten occupations in the 1855 state census in Massachusetts. So shoemaker, farmer, clergyman, keep on going. And so the reason we're going to do this is we're going to have a change. Our shift when we get to our exposure measure is going to be between 1850 and 1855 for data restraints. And so 1850 is available from the federal census. We had to digitize 1855 state census because if we used 1860, that'd be like way after they lost. We want to get this sort of contemporaneous um, shift. And so we're going to have the full 1850 census and the full 1855 state census. Again, why Massachusetts? Because they have the state census. Uh, okay, so when I actually take this data, what do we do with it? We're going to break people into 11 occupation categories. So things like labor, fisherman, farmer, high-skilled mechanic, low-skilled mechanic, boots and shoes, just a few more. And so we're going to have 11 categories. We're going to take native shares in 1850 within the town. So what percent of your town's employment are farmers, um, fishermen? And then we're going to multiply that by the state level shift within that occupation. So how many Irish have moved into that occupation as a fraction of the total people that were in that occupation to start with? If you multiply those together, add them up, you're going to get a crowd out measure for your town I. And then we're going to standardize this to have mean zero standard deviation one. So everything we look at is for a standard deviation change in this index. What do we, what do we get? De-skilling. Similarly, we're going to use 1845 to 1855 because we wanted to go back as far as we could for the, the shares. For crowd out, 1850 is really the only first good census, so we have to start there. For manufacturing, we're able to go a little bit further back. So Massachusetts, again, took a state um, manufacturing census on the fives, where the federal one is on the tens. And so we digitized these guys from 45 and 55, which are a lot easier because they're typed in there. OCRable. Um, it's really cool because it has like, the different sort of Manchester town, the different industries that they have. Palm leaf hats are very popular in Massachusetts. Um, but most of these also have employment and the number of um, establishments that we have. And so we're going to use average establishment size. So here we know that there's 15 people. Boots and shoes are not in establishments, but you know, sort of essentially establishment, number of establishments. So there's 12 manufacturers of chairs. They have 120 people. We're going to use the average of the establishment size for that industry. We're going to control for these other things that don't actually include that information. So that's going to be our shift. Um, so again, this is a measure of movement into factories from small shops. So if you move into bigger firms in general, then that's going to be a movement into factories. And therefore, some economic historians have shown that's actually a sort of a de-skilling process. The bigger the establishment size gets, the sort of more low-skilled labor you're able to use. So we're punching to them to say that's true. Um, but we're going to say, again, local shares times state-level shift. 
So the local share here is going to be in that industry case. It's a bunch of industries. How many people are employed in 1845 as a share of the total population employed in 1840? Because we don't want to just have manufacturing employment, we want to have the full employment. So the share of everyone who's in the 1840 census who is in any different type of job. And again, so that, that times that, add them up over all of your industries and you get your just descaling index. So the bigger this thing is, the more movement into factories and the more use of low-skilled labor in your local, your local area based on that sort of just the industry um, mix that you had to start out with. Hi, Kath. Can I ask you a question? Do you feel like being interrupted? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just wondering, I mean, are you, are you concerned or are you allowing for the fact that the sort of de-skilling might also be driving, say, occupational change among the Irish? I mean, I would imagine that a lot of Irish show up and they see all these factory jobs. I mean, it's two questions. I mean, one is sort of, are they attracted to Boston or the area because there are these low-skilled jobs? Or do they change into those careers because they're already there? And how does... How do either one of those affect your identification strategy? I mean, is that sort of a worry? So I think that the, the idea here is to use state level shifts instead of local shifts, right? So we're, we don't care where the Irish go across Massachusetts in terms of the occupations that they go into. It's just which occupation they go. I don't care what town they go to. I think that'd be a much more concern if you're if you use the local shift because then it's entirely endogenous who shows up and how that affects your local labor market. We think of this as sort of a different model where I'm still threatened if I'm a bootmaker in the western part of the state. I'm still threatened if someone moves into Boston into bootmaking through the product market or through the wage market because there can be spillovers across the state. Um, we think of this as sort of an integrated market, and so if they come to Boston, but I'm not in Boston, I'm still affected by the fact that they're going to suppress wages. So, but it, but it does sort of rule out that I might just not like Irish people. I mean, you're sort of saying that the shock really is. I guess uh, you're kind of leaving that other part of the shock aside. So I guess like I have to yeah, think about so it. Yeah. Yeah, so we try to get at that, and I'll show you my, our regression specification. We try to get that with like some measure. We have a measure of how many Irish are in your town, and that doesn't seem to really pop because they're also voting. But we do see that especially this crowd op measure interacts with Irish, and I'll show you that because so that basically it's not only like my job is being threatened by this group, but I also see them in my town, and so therefore I vote differently. Yeah. Okay, so if you think about sort of what's happening with both of these indexes and you think about sort of where we get the intuition right so we have these 11 categories and we have native shares this is at the state level but you can think of this as a town we have native shares in different groups and then we have our shift in the crowd out um so a lot of crowd outs happening in factory operatives right these are these low-skilled factory operatives but not many natives initially work in those jobs and so that's not going to really drive a whole lot um the laborers are really where it's going to be coming in sort of these mechanic agriculture on the other hand there's a lot of natives that work in agriculture, but there's not a lot of Irish coming into agriculture. Right? So if I'm a town who has a lot of farmers, I don't really care because there's no Irish in my type of job. But if I'm a town that has a lot of boots and shoes or lots of laborers, mechanics, factory operatives, then I'm going to have a very high crowd out measure. Right? Those jobs are the ones that are being threatened. If you do something similar for industry, again, it depends on your sort of industrial mix, whether or not you have a high crowd out or low crowd out value. Okay, so we're going to um, run a pretty basic cross-sectional regression. So the vote share on the left-hand side is a function of crowd out and de-skilling, plus a million controls, none of which really matter. We can take them out. If you look at the paper, it doesn't matter what we put in there. We get the same numbers. But again, our identification assumption is sort of conditional on these things. We do get a causal effect. I'll show you some stuff to try to convince you that's true after we do the main results. And our sort of main specification has county fix effects, controls for percent Irish, we have some urbanization and some other industrialization, how many um, establishments per capita I think is in there. And then we have these sort of, what sort of Gardner talked about is um, cultural controls essentially, right? This idea that the Irish are not immigrate, are not assimilating, and that they're paupers or they're a burden on the state. We don't see that those two things actually tend to drive voting behavior. Um, but they're in there as controls. And then we also control for the share manufacturing and share agriculture in 1840, not 50. So that then a little bit of our stuff is living a little bit off of changes because we're controlling for the basic pre-existing stuff about these places. We're going to weight by number of voters because the governor's elected by popular vote. Um, it doesn't make sense for a tiny town to have the same weight as a huge city. We drop Boston, although if you go look at the robustness appendix, it does not matter. I'm just because they're huge relative to everyone else. And then we're going to repeat this regression across the years, um, sort of repeat it from 54 through 57, actually even 58. So the no nothings do continue to field a candidate all the way through 1859. So we run this from 54 to 59. 54 is really the rise. They're in power 54, 55, and 56. And then they lose in 57 and they really get no support after that. 
the Republicans really take over. And so here, this is our descaling index. And again, these are sort of one standard deviation, how this affects vote share. So here it's about one and a half, 1.8 um, percentage point increase in the vote share for our standard deviation change in descaling. Um, and that stays significant um, in 56. It kind of goes away in 55 a little bit. And then it really does not predict anything after 56. And again, how big are these? Well, they're, they're big enough, but they're not enough to explain the fact that the No Nothing Party got 63% of the vote. Right. So there's definitely sort of what we call a Massachusetts fixed effect. There's this anti-Catholicism going on, but we do explain a lot of the variation across towns and who votes for it using this and also the crowd out measure. Similar results for crowd out, a little bit stronger maybe. We get about 3.8% increase in the vote share for our standard deviation. Um, and this persists across all three years in which they run. Um, and then again, by 57, they sort of go away and just don't the economic factors really don't predict too much about their votes by then. And again, these are a little bit bigger. Uh, we can't reject that the two are the same in any, that descaling and no nothing, or sorry, descaling crowd out are the same in any year. Um, I think statistically they're the same. Um, so basically what we say that is in these three years, it seems that, you know, both factors really did matter for, for voting behavior. It's not just labor market competition. It's really the sort of slow burning industrialization thing that actually also mattered for people's decisions how to vote. So the next thing I do is try to get at this idea of sort of nativism versus these economic factors really mattering. Are we just picking up the fact that, you know, it's it's just we happen to be in these types of jobs and we just happen to really dislike Irish people. And so that's how we get these relationships. Um, so we take this from political science and define stronghold locations. So here there's a bunch more in the paper, but the second one uses this definition that these are places that always support the Donor Think Party, right? They're kind of unmovable relative to these other towns, which sort of aren't always above the 75th percentile, and they might actually have a little bit more um, margin to be affected. And so what we see here is exactly that, that essentially for non-stronghold locations, our main results are the same. But if you add these two for these places that are always consistently on board with the know-nothings, they don't really have an, a reaction to economic shocks, right? Their vote shares are pretty much always high, and they just don't really react as much to these things. And so we think that there are places that are very just sort of hardcore nativists and don't react to economic shocks, but the rest of the places are sort of these very willing to adjust in response to things that are happening. Sure. Sorry, Catherine, a question. question. But are yes. the stronghold though places where coincide with places where there is a large share of those top occupation where the... So are, are you wiping out within the stronghold a lot of the variants essentially? Are you, or are the stronghold in terms of industrial stru in occupational structure similar to the rest? I do not know the answer to that question, but we can definitely check for you. It's a good question. I, I don't think we've looked at the characteristics of them. It could be that they're, yeah, they're like mill towns. And so they're always gonna do that because they've got these very high crowd out. And so that's, that's a good question. We should, we should definitely check that, thanks. Okay. so. We do a bunch of stuff to try to convince you that this is causal. So again, there might be a lot of omitted variables going on here. Uh, we don't have any fancy IV or any particularly great natural experiment, but we do control for anything we can think of. Um, so we control for a lot of different factors that could be correlated with these local shares and with other stuff that we're not accounting for. So the thing that I find the most convincing is controlling for sectoral shares from 1840. The 1840 census is not great. It's a household level census, not a person, like a person level census. And it just says, are you employed in one of seven different industries? Yes or no. So there's not a lot of, we can't use this for our main shares, which would be great, but we can do it. What we can do is control for these things in the regression, right? So while our crowd out is living off of 1850 shares, we can control for the 1840 shares that are slightly different, different categories, but then we're essentially living off of changes, not just the level of these things, right? So if you're just an agricultural place and you are always have been, then we can control for that. And so that doesn't affect anything if we do that, we find pretty convincing. We can also control for what was going on before the Irish immigration started, right? So are you just a place that never liked the Whig party and so therefore you like the know-nothings later? And there's something else going on. So the know-nothings weren't running in 1844, obviously, but the Whigs were the ones who really won. And there was a lot of variation and sort of support for the Whig versus support for the Democrat party in, in that year. Um, so we control for that. And it doesn't seem that pre-existing political factors really affect you know, what's going on now. And so those are sort of the two main controls that I think are the most convincing. And then again, so I said these, these German and British are very useful for us in the sense that they're, they have different skill content, right? They tend to be literate. They tend to work in the higher skilled jobs and compete in these other types of jobs. Um, and so what we do is we take, we recreate our crowd out measure, again, with these native shares, but using the German and the British as shifts instead of the Irish as a shift. And we don't get any results on that. So we're going to 
throw that into the regression along with our Irish crowd out and we see that Irish crowd out pops and the German, German and British really don't. And we think that that's the German and British are, you know, they're immigrants, they're competing with natives, um, but they're not sending off this sort of nativist response because they're very different and they look a lot more like the native than they look like the, the other immigrants. So they, they're not able to use the nativism sort of against that group. We see that the, so if we look at the share wig in 1844 actually as an outcome, right? So see whether, you know, later stuff affects earlier stuff. We're not going to see anything there. Um, in the paper, there's some permutation tests that shows that our estimates are sort of at the top of you know, mess stuff around. And then in terms of heterogeneity, we're going to see that crowd out really interacts with percent Irish, but nothing else. There's no sort of interaction between de-skilling and crowd out. It's really this sort of this one, this one uh, interaction that pops. Sorry, can I ask you, Catherine, can you say again how you interpret this fact that the British and the German crowd out doesn't have the same effect? Isn't that an argument against the economic factor? If it was purely economic, uh, the German and the British are immigrants, they are crowding out some different sectors. If they do, doesn't that say that there is something special about the Irish or special about the interaction between Irish and occupation, which is not just a general crowding out uh, effect. I'm, I'm not sure why the crowding out uh, from a purely economic point of view would not be there with the group and would be there with uh, uh, Irish. I mean, so there's, there's a couple of like, reasons that, I mean, so we think of this as a test because essentially the Germans and the Brits, there's a lot fewer of them. Um, so they're not really as much of a, like a cultural threat. And so I think it's definitely true that, you know, that it's not only that the Irish are moving in to these jobs, it's really that they're also not like us. And I think we are definitely picking up some of that with our, with our measure that essentially these types of jobs are the ones that are really being, um, being affected and that therefore they're voting against the group that's got these large shocks coming in. The British and the Germans are, you know, they're Protestant mostly, the Germans not necessarily, but I think that you're right, there's definitely some sort of interaction between like, this is the group we really don't like, and they're moving into our types of jobs. I think that Greg probably can explain this better than me, actually. No, I don't want to hang yeah. you up. It, it sounds like there is some interaction here when you're talking about this cultural aspect and the economic. So if in a pure economic case, you just take another group and you look uh, if uh, the whole effect is economic, they should have the same. But uh, okay, you have 10 minutes, so I'm going right. to stop here so and let you go. The other reason, I mean, so the other reason we like doing this is because, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be way ahead of time. Um, I think the other reason we like this is because it's saying something about whether it's the shares or the shifts that are really driving what's going on. There's always this issue that like, is it just fundamental things about the town, about those shares that are going to crowd out? And is it not about the shift? And so it seems to be the Irish shift that really is driving this thing, not those local shares, because the British and the Germans are created with the same shares, but a different shift. And so I think that that's the concern we're really trying to get at is that all of this literature about um, shift shares is basically saying, is it the share of the shift? And we think it's the shift of Irish that's really driving identification, not the, not the local shares. Um, but I, I take your point and we should, we should definitely think about that further. So that's what we see here. So we basically control for, we have Irish crowd out and then control for British, German, and British and German, and they don't pop. And our Irish one really stays the same, right? So the Irish is really um, being affected. These are our placebo outcomes. In 1844, we could look at the Democrat vote share or the Whig vote share. You know, that one's got a star on it, but there's not really any super strong patterns here, either our descaling or our crowd out really predicting things that are going on before our measures are created. I wish that star wasn't there, but eh, it's not so bad. And so we, we basically think that, again, it's not something fundamental about these places that's going on. It really is these shocks and the changes that are happening that matter for what happens for voting. So I'm actually, yeah, I'm going to end early. So hopefully you have lots of questions. I'm always worried I'm going to run over. So basically what we're going to see here is that crowd out and descaling really contributed to the no thing rise. So again, if you say sort of counterfactually, what would have happened if we just take these away, um, you get about 15% of the no nothing vote would reduce. And sort of these factors were really, sorry, I swear I updated my slides and they didn't update. Just ignore 56, 57. Um, 1855, this was pivotal, right? So there's a lot of literature out there on sort of populism and voting behavior and saying, you know, what is it about um, economic factors? Are they sort of, are they explaining the sort of big fixed effect? Or are they really just explaining, you know, flipping you just over the margin? Um, and here we're really just getting you just over that, that margin of 55. The other years, we gotta ignore that. Um, the other year is they're just winning by such a landslide that these factors are not really decisive um, in terms of what happens. And so we think of this as sort of an interesting period in history because you've got this sort of fracture of the system. Right? You think about now, like could a nativist party, like a new nativist party really come in? They'd have to be able to you know, basically defeat one of the 
two parties that runs right now. And so this is an interesting sort of experiment in history where we had this vacuum and this party is really able to put together a platform and really sort of live off of, you know, the fact that there's that competition for a second um, from the second party. It's a short-lived movement, right? So again, they get kicked out in 57, partly because they are terrible at governing. They basically bankrupt the state, but also because the economic factors don't matter anymore as slavery becomes a much more um, important thing. Um, the Republican Party is also just much more successful at making a national platform and really taking on the anti-slavery. And so by 1857, the know-nothings are left only with essentially nativism and these economic factors. And by 1857, a lot of these factors that we talked about have actually started going the other direction. Right? So the economy is booming by 57. Immigration has actually fallen off a cliff. Like we saw that big spike, but it goes back down. And so people are not nearly as worried about these economic factors. They're much more worried about the slavery aspect um, that's coming up to the Civil War. So we see that basically by 57. And then after that, um, they just don't get much of the vote share. And a lot of their votes go to the Republican Party. We actually track the legislators with their names in the general court. And we see that a few of them end up in the Republican Party. So there's some nativists sort of slipping into there, but a lot of them just leave politics. Um, so it's really a sort of this, these people come in, join politics, and then they decide to get out once their party's gone. Thanks. I'm done. Thank you, Catherine. So I'm going to leave it to Simone to manage uh, the question uh, uh, that are coming That's from perfect. the panel. So there's already a couple of questions from Michael and Joan. So Michael Clemens. Can you hear me? Yeah, now. Now we Thank can. you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Simone, and the rest of you, Catherine. This is really fascinating. You you move quickly over that uh, hand coding of three hundred thousand microfilms. You have uh, so much PTSD. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a. Uh, I mean, achievements like that, uh, they, they they should get a seminar of their own. But I, I was just. Um, I was curious how to think about violations of stable unit treatment value assumption in this setting. That it, it, it seems to me, although I need to think more carefully about it, that the regression specification is, uh, relies on that assumption for causal identification. And, and we can, uh, uh, certainly at the, at the occupation level, we can think of reasons why that's not true, that, that working people in quote unquote neighboring occupations could exhibit a, a solidarity across occupations. And, and certainly in the, in the qualitative history literature about this time, that it seems clear that that was going on and, and that, that I, I, I in fact care inherently about the wages of, uh, of people in other occupations because they're but for the grace of God or why. At the same time, you could imagine reasons it goes in the other direction, that there's a negative spillover that I, I in, in fact, I, if I'm consumer of what is being produced by the Irish masses in, in the in the cheap labor factories, I, I'd be delighted to to know that their their wages were lower, and and that both of these could affect my my vote behavior. And if, if that's true, the bias could be ambiguous. I I, I need not interpret the coefficient estimates as informative bounds, uh, but there could be very good reasons to disbelieve in either of these stories that I'm fabricating. <laughs> no, I think. On the second point, you're right that, I mean, through the product market and stuff like that, like you definitely benefit from lower wages by the fact that boots and shoes become so much cheaper over this period. You know, there's definitely falls in prices that affect agriculture people and people that are not in these types of jobs. I'm not sure we can do anything about that. I mean, I think that's another, yeah, that's another sort of drawback to what we're, we're finding. We take these occupation categories the way we do sort of to try and get around your first point that essentially we want people to be sort of substitutable and sort of in the same types of jobs within the occupation category. But across, it's really a big stretch. Like you can't become a high skilled mechanic if you're a low skilled, you can't really jump that. Mm -hmm. But I could, yeah, I could definitely see them caring about the other, <laughs> other type. I don't know, like I, it, the, I mean, the, the no-no things, like all of their literature is very much, you know, saying these mechanics are the ones that vote for the party and the ones that support us because they're seeing the biggest economic downturn. Whereas like these other, like if you look at sort of like the membership of these, the lodges that actually become the party, they tend to be sort of the mid-skilled mechanic people. They're not the farmers. They're not the like super low skilled. They're really the types that are really, really much getting crowded out. Mm -hmm. Um and so the farmers, they really just aren't voting for this party. They're just like, we're going to vote. Um, I guess they vote Democrat, but they're not, they don't really support the party. So I don't, I'm not sure that they really care about the factory workers, I guess. Yeah, I wonder if you could use that qualitative information to fashion placebo tests that are, that are informative about this point. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a table five kind of concern. Yeah, it's definitely something we need to think about more. Yeah. That's, 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 I mean, I don't have a great answer for you for those questions. I think that's a big concern that 
I think we can only get qualitative evidence about. Um, but yeah, if I'm not sure it's a big concern. I think I think it's an interesting area to explore. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, Joan Moros. Yeah, so uh, two quick questions. So the first one is I don't fully understand uh, one thing, which is I don't know how much commuting or relationships within different uh, spillovers within different towns there is, right? Uh, and so to what extent is it a, a concern? For instance, you could put, be putting some uh, measurement error on your dependent variables and which would lead to one underestimate of the effects that, you, that you're finding. The second question, a little bit related to Giovanni's point, is whether, and I guess related to the, the later discussion, is to what, ex, uh, what are the characteristics of the voters of the Know Nothing Party? Are they mainly low skill or high skill? Who are these workers that are uh, changing towards that party? And, uh, uh, and what do we know about that? Yeah, so on your first point, there's definitely some commuting that happens across like local towns. So if you think like you read back in the sort of history literature, like people definitely say that, you know, you would have mill workers living in one town, but they actually work in the neighboring town. And so there, that could happen. We've got a table in the paper that tries to estimate spatial correlations and account for those any spillovers. And we don't see that that really matters for the main result. So we have tried to account for that and just make sure that it's not spatial correlation that's happening. So that's, I don't know, table 12 or something. I have no idea. And on the other point of who are the voters, we don't know because we don't really have, again, individual level voting data. But what we do have is membership lists. So these this party comes out of these like secret lodges, which are sort of 1850 or so through the whole period. Um, and that's where the Know Nothing name comes from. If you were asked about it, you say, I know nothing. I don't know what you're talking about. And so we do know who the people were that were in those lodges. And so they're the ones that are the hardcore supporters, presumably. And they tend to be the mid-skilled mechanic types. Um, they're not like super low skilled. It's not the laborers. And that could be if you had to pay to get in, I don't know. But I think it's it's really the these mid-skilled guys in the cities that are you know very anti-immigration because they're like, they're taking our jobs and they're threatening our livelihood. Um, and that's in a, I think it's in the paper in a footnote, but some other people, historians have worked on that too and said that there, it's sort of the average man. It's not, it's not the really low skilled on, on average. It's the, the people that are really losing their jobs in factories. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Ilel. Yes. Uh, hello, Katrin. Uh, thanks for this uh, nice talk. I wanted to, to come back on a probably minor aspect, but a point that was raised by Giovanni about the Germans. I think the Germans that came to the US in the late 40s and early 50s were uh, not uh, laymen and uh, low skill workers. And, and most of their, uh, you know, this immigration is the, the 48ers and the political refugees. And there is this paper in, uh, in the AR uh, coming out, uh, you know, on, on their role in the building of democracy. And I, I don't know if this is something you, you address in, in the paper, but they, they show that they had not just, uh, they were not just different, but they also countered the nativist movements and, uh, the, and so on. So I, I was wondering whether this can both explain, you know, the, the, the fact that they, they turn out different from the Irish, but also that they kind of uh, played an, an active role in, in decreasing the, the votes uh, for these movements, such as the non nothing party and so on. So I think it, it may be a, a matter of interest for itself and in interaction with what, what you're showing. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, we definitely argue in the paper that they're of a different skill content than the Irish. Like that's, that's sort of the idea here is that they are high skilled and um, they are going to different types of jobs. I think it'd be useful yeah, to highlight that they're actually working the opposite direction. So it could be, you know, if you're a place with more German crowd out, I mean, you've got more German workers too, and that they're sort of countering this thing. That's a definitely a cool way to to pitch it we should put that <laughs> we'll steal that idea yeah they're they're definitely very different skills and different like types of people uh -oh. i think you're talking but you're muted maybe okay so let me i just need to allow another another participant to, to talk so martin hi catherine thank you i just wanted to ask you about the shares that you that you were using whether they were considering only men or both genders whether this matters when we compare natives and Irish, and whether these differences between towns that have a lot of Irish men competing in certain sectors and other towns who have 
more Irish families could be exploited to separate the mechanism of being exposed to Irish people and all the, for instance, the religious content of the Know Nothing Party versus the, the economic mechanisms that, that you proposed. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I'm just laughing because it's the bane of my existence is that they don't bother asking women if they work until 1860. And so the census in 1850, our shares have to be men because women just do not report occupations. Particularly frustrating Massachusetts because women are working at much higher rates than they would be in other places. In particular, the Irish women are almost definitely working in the factories. Um, and so we're not going to miss pick that up. And that could be some measurement. Um, measurement differences. But again, that's going into our state level shift. The local shares are just natives and the native women probably aren't working nearly as much as immigrants. But again, you can't do anything on that. They would be in the manufacturing and the descaling index and it's just employment. And so we would have women in there, but not in the, not in our crowd out measure, which is infinitely frustrating. So I, yeah, I, I mean, when we do like percent Irish as a control, we're just using all Irish. I mean, we could definitely break that into female versus male. I think that actually might be interesting because the men, if they native, if they if they naturalize, they could vote. The woman couldn't. So that could be an interesting way to think about sort of exposure versus cleaning out sort of the people that are voting um, separately. But I think we could, we could think about that. We do know if someone's from Ireland, if they're a female, we just don't know if they're working. So we can't use them in the, in the crowd out measure which is so annoying. <laughs> so I go back and tell the census workers to do a better job. <laughs> every, census, every census has a problem, but in particular. Okay. So are there further questions from some of the organizers or other attendees? Just a quick one. Uh, did you guys do the boring uh, but now required uh, uh, checks uh, of uh, Goldsmith, Pinkham, and Borisiak on the shift share? Or you guys uh, are going to think to get away without doing that stuff? Um, I think that's on a to-do list. <laughs> it's that last thing that we're just kind of dragging our feet on. So we, we think of this sort of like these controlling for the sectoral shares in 1840 is something a little bit similar because it's then, you know, it's saying, do these pre-characteristics, you know, wipe out what we're doing? The issue with their- I'm only I mean, asking Catherine, because at some point you seem agree. to suggest that the identification come from the shift and not from the share. And that to me seems very unlikely because I don't think you have enough variation with uh, a dozen of sectors to really get a strong identification from the shift. Uh, um, and I, my feeling is that it has to come from the share. So doing the test of Goldsmith Pinkham to see where the identification come from and how important is the variation in shares seem to me relevant. I agree that you do a lot of other checks and so you can uh, get away, but then uh, that uh, the way you set up things, uh, I will be surprised if you have enough power in just the share variation to generate uh, this uh, uh, identification. Okay, um, yeah, it's on our to-do list. We're just mm, <laughs> dragging our feet on it. So I will make sure it gets in there before we submit. Yeah, we're pretty much done with everything else, but that's like the last thing that's like on the whiteboard. Is Sorry, I, I don't know. Maybe you should try without hey. because it's a pain. But. Uh, I don't know. Somebody's going to raise it and... Uh, Somebody's going to say I, it. You're not the first point. person to say it. Yeah. Yeah, we, I know. I'm sorry. We know it. those papers. We're just... Oh, just sit down and do it. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Suleen? Hi, Catherine. Thank you for the presentation. I just have... Now that I've heard that you just before submitting, this might not be a useful suggestion for you, but... Um, I was wondering what the role of labor unions were around the time and whether some sectors and industries were more protected by labor unions and what their position to incoming migrants was. Was there like a differential exposure to the economic consequences of immigration from the Irish, depending on how protected these sectors were? And the second point is about any digitized news outlets from that time where you could use some text sentiment analysis to really drill down what the concerns were about the Irish versus the Germans and the Brits. Was that really the economic or the cultural factors? I'm not sure if that fits into your research schedule, but those were just two minor points that I wanted to, to ask about. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um... There are definitely a lot of digitized newspapers. Um, we haven't gone down that route. I mean, we have sort of the, 
the classic stuff that the historians have brought out and said this is, you know, what the newspapers were saying. I think that this period in particular, the every newspaper has a political affiliation. Um, and so, yeah, the Know Nothing papers were really talking, the stuff that we've seen really are talking about the Irish and not the Germans and the Brits. They're really saying sort of, again, all three of these things, right? They're, they're culturally a threat to us. Um, they're also economically a threat to us. And so this is sort of the, again, this like, just big thing together and we try to control for the cultural stuff and we just don't we just I think we just don't have great measures of it but we could yeah I mean maybe maybe while the paper submitted for the next round we can do some more reading on the labor union thing I think Greg might know more than I do about labor unions this period but as far as I know I think that unions are pretty weak in Massachusetts by this period um they're like Massachusetts they were trying to get even like a 12-hour workday and they couldn't pass that um, the labor movement in Massachusetts was pretty unsuccessful at any like change before this. And so as far as I know, I think the unions were actually quite weak in this period still. So I don't know that that would have really affected, you know, different groups in different ways. I mean, they would be associated with factories. And so I think, you know, they, they would definitely, they would exist. I mean, I, the only like anecdotal thing I know is that I think in, um, I think it was a little earlier than this, but there were some factory workers that striked. Um, and when they did that, and when they went on strike, they would bring in Irish immigrants to bust the strikes. And so that would definitely be a sort of one way in which I think those unions, yeah, they would they would be more more for the natives than for the immigrants because the immigrants are going to be used to basically break up any labor um, distressed, unrest. Okay. So thanks a lot, Catherine. It's almost uh, 30 years in France. So I would call the day if there are no further questions. And I would like to, to thank you, Greg, and all the other for, for being online. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the invitation, all the comments. Bye.